Okay, good evening everyone. Uh, thanks for having me uh, here today. Two, uh, two knowledge fields ago, I was also here and I presented uh, on the data. And basically what I presented is, uh, we wanted to uh, set up a sum of code. We wanted to invite people uh, to work with us. Uh, and today I will just present what happened in the last three months, what we learned, uh, what was good, what was not so good, and uh, what would be interesting to discuss this with you. Um, I will have much less slides, I think it's only 10 slides or something. Um, and basically, there will be one slide that I introduce on the data, for those of you who don't know it, this is most of you. Uh, then we have three projects one was a security and vulnerability assessment, the other one was a Python tutorial for on the data, and the third one was an extension of an existing app we already have. And then there's the learnings. Uh, what did we experience? What is on your data? Um, basically, I uh, just killed 2004. I think the Semantic Web Company was founded. People founded uh, October 26, 2015. So we're looking forward to our first Thursday. <laughs> we're still very young. Currently, we are six people. And the idea is of on your data making data accessible to everyone. Currently, who benefits from data? This is uh, large companies to serve as ads. Uh, this is Facebook or Google. Uh, they just use our data in their interest to sell us more stuff. And there is government agencies who want to check if you're terrorists. Basically, in the short version. But this is what data is currently used for. And we think um, data can do so much more. It is just that we need to find the data out there, our data, store it, and analyze it. This is maybe easy if you have some engineering background, if you have some mathematical background, but for layman people, this is actually quite hard. And what we are trying is on your data, uh, making this easy again. Uh, we are a non-profit organization, and there are three pillars, of course. The one is uh, we want to provide information about uh, legal ramifications. What does it mean when you store some of the data? Is it secure? When you store it in the US, uh, who has access to it? When you store it in the European Union? Because we have actually a big benefit here in the European Union. In 2018, we'll have the uh, Datenschutzgrundverordnung, whatever it's called in English. Um, this is a really great thing that we are really the owners of the data. People need to tell us, companies, when they use our data, what to do with it. Uh, so this is really big steps, they're also bad sides of this uh, new legislation, but actually I think most of the things are really good. And this uh, legal ramifications just give us some theoretical possibility to do something. And we want to really make it a practical, practical use case. Uh, for instance, we have uh, published a document where is it most safest uh, to store your data. And we found out it's in Sweden currently. Um, then, of course, we look quite a lot into security. This is one of the uh, some of code projects where we said, okay, the software that we develop, uh, the infrastructures that we create to collect data, to analyze data, how secure is it, what are the problems, um, and we create one document during the sum of code. Um, interesting thing is, how much is data worth? In the US, sometimes you get offers, if you show me your energy consumption, you get one month of uh, electricity for free. Is this a good deal? Is this a bad deal? Would you take it here in Europe? Um, there's actually very sparse information available. How much is data worth? Just everybody collects it if you're a company. Because uh, maybe it is something worth. Uh, of course, you all know this. Um, and then, also, we have this feeling there is data out there, but actually, where is it exactly? How can I access it? If you have ever tried, uh, we have this already in Austria, so you can write a letter and say, okay, because of, I don't know what legislations, I want to have my data from a Merkur grocery card. What have you spent at Merkur because I have my uh, customer card and I want to have this data? And uh, it's already a law in Austria that we need to get it, so that I'm allowed to get it. I tried it now for one year, it's not possible. I even found a guy who was implementing the system and said, yes, they have all those attributes. I didn't get it. Uh, even some governmental organizations don't get this data. Uh, so it's also kind of, we have a legal guy uh, in our team, he's a friend of Max Schrems. Uh, so we don't always need to go to Facebook in the US to find uh, some really bad things. We can even start fixing things here in Austria. And this is also something we are looking into. So this is the information part. The second pillar is 
uh, really writing algorithms. When you have the data, how can you visualize this? How can you analyze this? Uh, what really uh, programs can you use to extract data that you have maybe in PDFs, that you have uh, somewhere else? Um, we have a few algorithms now, but this is uh, something we really need to focus on in the next few years. And we are uh, building an infrastructure. Uh, here we work completely different or radically different than other internet services. Usually what you do is you provide data, send it to some service, they store it for you and you get some analysis or you get an answer. We do it completely different. We provide a data vault, a data safe if you want so, where you can store your data. This is an open source uh, software. You can install it on your local PC, you can install it on a Raspberry. If you want, you can also run it in the cloud. But basically, this is your place where you store the data. This is, behind it's just a Postgres database, uh, that also makes sure who is allowed to store data and uh, who can access data and read it. It's just a Rust, REST API. And uh, it is just documented what everybody does there. And this is my personal place to manage my data. This is one infrastructure element that we provide. Uh, and then we also run a marketplace. And the marketplace is algorithms that can then be downloaded to your data vault. That is, we don't move data somewhere to be analyzed, but we move the programs to the place that you deem safe for your data. And there, data is analyzed. Uh, basically, what we're using behind this is Docker images uh, where you do the data analysis. Yes, and then we're running a few servers, for instance, in uh, Sweden, where we say, okay, this is, if you want to use a cloud service, the most secure place uh, to store your data. And of course, we also offer you, if you want to buy Raspberry, um, that you run it all locally, this is possible, and you can also run it, as I said, on your PC. Basically, this is what uh, Own Your Data is about. Uh, we're kind of uh, idealistic people. We were quite happy that last year we got funding from uh, Netidate. So we got a little bit of our expenses covered. And also, this is kind of strange, Google uh, got, we got funded from Google. Uh, we can use adverts, quite a lot of uh, adverts actually. I think they just didn't understand what we were doing, but <laughs> currently we can spend almost $300 a day on advertising uh, with Google for free. So this is <laughs> a nice thing. Okay, let's now go into the three projects that we did um, over the course of the summer. The first one was from Max Riedel, and basically he wrote a report on the risks that impact confidentiality, integrity, and availability of peer for security improvements, resilience measures, and mitigation strategies. What you see here, the peer, uh, this was the old name, what we learned is not good. Uh, peer stands for Personal Information Archive. This is what we call now the data vault. So basically, your safe place to source the data. This is a uh, JHipster application currently, Java application uh, on top of a Postgres database where you can store data in and read data out. And we just did an, uh, a security and vulnerability assessment. Uh, here, how it works, I think this was uh, quite an interesting process. First, you define your primary assets in such an assessment. Uh, those are usually intangibles. So, um, what we provide is that you trust us, the software that it works. This is kind of an intangible asset, that you, this is trust. From those intangible assets that we have identified, we go to supporting assets. Those are now assets that you can really touch. So this, is, this is a concrete software that we have developed. This is a server that is uh, maybe developed in China or maybe here locally in Austria. And you maybe trust more when it's done here in Austria. Um, and based on those primary assets, we have the supporting assets. And this support, this supporting assets, we do an um, impact assessment and the likelihood scenarios. So when something has a very low business impact, if something goes wrong on one of those tangible assets, and if the likelihood that this occurs is also low, then we're in the upper left here, and uh, those dangers which say, okay, we need not to focus so much on it. But then there are things that have a very high business impact and that are very likely, those we are here now in the red corner, and those we need to look at, those things we need to fix. And we identified, I think, 300 or 400 things that we really need to look at it, and then we evaluated those things, and we, for our implementation, we found two sevens. 
so the fix now we had found a, a SQL uh, injunction vulnerability and the other thing was it was possible that you access data that you when you are not allowed to so if you had one algorithm assessing some data and another one there would be a possibility to access another data slot so those two things that we found uh, and so the fixed right now but basically this 22 page report uh, really worked through this process of identifying problems it was very interesting for us especially this external view that we had, and it uh, was really great to work together with Max. Second project, uh, currently this on your data, uh, the infrastructure is mainly written in Java, and the algorithms are written in R, this is mainly my part, uh, I'm writing the algorithms, and uh, I found one guy, Stephen Malin, who is a really Python fan, and said, okay, uh, it's also to be possible to access all your data with a different language. And uh, he wrote a tutorial for Python. And this uh, then also brought me to write uh, additional uh, tutorials that are now also available for Ruby, for JavaScript, and you can even access it on the command line. So basically, the data store you have, how can you access it? This is OAuth 2 uh, authentication that we access it. And you just, uh, first thing the routine that you implement is to get a token and then how to read items, update items, uh, write items, and uh, delete items. So simple REST API basically, but it's quite interesting to have it now for different languages available. And the third project we did, um, for now I just spoke just generally what can you do about it. One application set or one algorithm that you can use with on your data is, maybe you know it in Austria when you have an online account, bank account, you get only the last two or three years of account statement um, of when I mean, you buy something or do something out of the counter bewegung. You get only the last three years. Afterwards, you get a, just a PDF, I think the last five years. And if you want data of your account that is older than five years, you have even to pay to get this data out. So this is uh, at least what we found out is easy bank. And what we said, uh, this is actually a bad thing. And it would be very nice to download monthly or every year all your uh, online data in a CSV format, import it into the data store, and then get a nice chart. Uh, what was your, how many money did you have at each point in time, and do some nice anal uh, analysis. How much did I spend in supermarkets? How much uh, did I withdraw from uh, ATM? And how much did I spend on public transport, whatever and to do this uh, just some nice visualizations. Um, there was a basic version available uh, at the beginning of the summer and there was Roger Gomez, also from uh, Vienna Data Science Group that I met here three months ago. He said, yeah, it's actually a nice thing. Uh, and he contributed. Unfortunately, he, this was the one project that was not finished. Uh, in the meantime, he went back to Spain and there's some other difficulties. Unfortunately, I'm not in contact with him anymore. But at least still it triggered uh, that, we have now, that we have now a new user interface for this application. Um, also when we were sitting together the first time, I found out the first time how hard it is if you complete at the beginning to write an algorithm. So we have now Docker containers that makes these things uh, much, much easier. And also it introduced a few new functions in this uh, bank applications. Uh, I have a screenshot, so previously it looked like on the uh, left side, this was just a um, uh, GG plot, uh, static image at the beginning. Now we have a uh, dynamic image, uh, <coughs> we can hover over and see some information, and it's just looking a little bit uh, nicer. If you want, uh, I can also give you an, a quick intro into one of those uh, uh, algorithms or applications that we're using uh, at the end of the uh, application. As the end of the presentation. So those were the three uh, projects. And now, what were the learnings? I think this is the most interesting part here. Uh, just at the beginning, because we had the Vienna Data Science Group, I have to say, our well, sample size is three. So maybe it takes us with a salt, a grain of salt. Uh, but still, I think maybe uh, it applies um, to others. Um, for others who maybe also want to try such a sum of code project, we will do it for sure also next year because uh, the results were really, really important for us on your data. The first one is what we found, participants must be enthusiastic about the topic because we provided at the beginning a list of what we would be interested in uh, that people should be working on and 
the only one that we said, okay, we want to improve our applications. This was the bank app. And this was Roger who's working on it, and he said, yeah, it's okay. And he was the one actually then he dropped out and said, okay, he doesn't have the time anymore, and uh, didn't work out. Uh, for Max Riedel, I know him quite some time now. He is really passionate about the security, about those analysis stuff. Uh, and he said, yes, he will do it for sure, and he really loved it. Uh, and also the same was uh, with this Python guy, who said, okay, he loves Python so much, for whatever reason, and he wanted to have <laughs> only a data with Python. So I think when you do such thing, if you get uh, such people uh, seeing this enthusiasm, is, I think, quite, I think it's even the most important features that you should be looking at. The next one, I thought, okay, uh, since we had a little bit of money from NetGD, I uh, gave a 200 euro bounty. 200 euro is you can have really together a very nice uh, a dinner if you go somewhere. Uh, and we found out 200 euros is a bad bounty. Um, for Max Riedel, he is actually a well-known expert uh, beyond Austria. He is actually currently in Australia doing uh, such analysis with uh, air traffic management in Australia right now. Uh, and he said, uh, you know, if I do this, I get, uh, I think his hourly rate is 150, 200 euros or something. And I spent now 20 hours doing this. And I said, okay, I can't give you <laughs> 150 euros. This is just beyond. And I think we agreed then uh, we have an hourly rate that we can give with this net a day of 30 euros. And we agreed about 520 euros. And we said, okay, because we learned really so much and we wanted to give and appreciate so what he did. Um, 520 euro he got. The guy who did the Python tutorial said, okay, this is so much fun, he doesn't want to take any money and uh, just here you have it. And Roger, for him, at least the 200 euros were also not that much motivation, said he continued to work on it. So I don't know what we'll do next year, but what we learned, 200 euros is not a good bounty. And the most important thing is, uh, is the great feedback that you get. When you do such sum of code projects first, you really have to talk with people who have, don't know the project before, because we are six people working on this more or less uh, uh, every day, but uh, quite a lot of time, and then really going out, showing this to others who really need to interact with it, was a very important uh, yeah, experience for us, and this was uh, the best feedback actually that we got in the last half year. Okay, um, this is actually it. Um, since we are a um, non-profit organization and we are now NetDT funded, what we really would need is spreading the word. That is, if you like us on Facebook or if you follow us on Twitter, Twitter we have now already, I think we have those goals from NetDT, we need 100 uh, Facebook likes that we have already now, but we need followers. If you are on Twitter, please be so kind, uh, follow us at uh, on your data EU. We don't tweet that much, but at least when we release new documents, when we release new software, at least there you would read it. Uh, you can also visit us at on the data EU. And if you're interested, I can give you now a short demo how this on your data thing works. Or if you have questions in the meantime, please just interrupt me, sorry. I think that was yes. Okay, so then I will show how it works. So so what I have here. This is the data fault. When you log in, I just created it on the fly uh, for the Vienna Data Science Group uh, data fault. Um, this is really just one minute. It should be possible uh, in one week or so also on the website that you click, I want to have a data fault, and it will be available online on our uh, Sweden server. And basically what it does, uh, this data fault is, um, you register plugins. A plugin is a plugin is just uh, something that is allowed to access the data uh, with specific uh, permissions. I just go back to normal mode, and I think it, you are just ran the time out and therefore you don't see it. Okay, so basically you log in, you authenticate. Here's a QR code. We have now an iOS app and an Android app, so you can also on your mobile uh, to just uh, access uh, all the applications and the data that you have on the go. Um, and 
here you can register, for instance, here, here I have now my content entwicklungs app that I will show, and the other one, we have a cooperation with Quintessence, I don't know if you know the guys on Museums Quartier, who do the big brother calls, and they just have the real big problem in the office area in the Museums Quartier, it's really, really hot in summer, and they say, okay, they want now to see how hot it is really, and also they want to trigger opening automatically the windows, and also uh, turning on ventilators, uh, so get just fresh air into it. And we're doing uh, this project together with the IoT Austria, and the big problems that the Quintix and Skies have, because they are now so um, data schützer, so that everybody needs to be secure, and we were the only ones who said, okay, here's a Raspberry, everything runs on the Raspberry, and um, you don't have to worry about the data, and therefore we launched this project. <coughs> and this ROM Klima app is basically, we have uh, like eight sensors right now, who collect uh, humidity, temperature in different places, and then we trigger opening windows and turning on some airflow. It's nothing big and fancy, but it's somehow the idea, this is data you have, and you can make something out of it. So, for the content features up, Basically, you see here from the last uh, beginning of July what were different uh, income and outtakes of my account. Um, and <laughs> let's go back. It's anonymous. Uh, actually, this is some data from 2007, and I've removed all names, but this is also when you go to our website, what you will see. And <coughs> actually, quite simple. Uh, here you say, uh, see. This is uh, what, data, uh, what money was available there, it goes down, and then maybe I can look why is there such a big drop, and we have here some analysis possibilities, and if I look here I can look at my uh, spendings, and I see here, okay, 16,000 euros, seems quite a lot, I can show the details, um, sort the details, and then I see, oh, I have uh, opened another account at Indiva and transferred 6,000 euros. Okay, so this is the reason. The possibilities that you have here is also uh, that you can uh, include multiple accounts and then you really see what your wealth is at any point of time. But the thing is, it's really the data is with you. Usually you wouldn't uh, give your account money data to someone else, but this gives you the possibility to do it completely on your own. You have also the possibility, uh, then if you select multiple things, to show this visually, uh, get a nice pie chart. That is a bad thing, but no, people are asking for it, and therefore, okay, we said we make a pie chart with compare groups. Um, basically, how most of the applications look like. First, you have here Auswertungen, so statistics that you can make of it. Uh, then you define data sources. Here you can just upload your contours to, uh, from, we have pre-configured for some uh, institutes, but if your uh, bank is not listed here, it is completely configurable where the data is. Uh, you can say uh, what at one point in time what uh, was your account amount because it's just every statement is just plus 20 euro, minus 50 euro. At one point you must say, okay, here is now so much money so you get a sensible uh, chart out of it. And the uh, uh, collected data is just an Excel sheet view uh, of the data that is available. So this is how most of the uh, applications look like. Getting uh, some analysis, defining where the sources for your data are, and then an Excel view. So nothing big, nothing fancy right now, but uh, we can also have here the wrong cleaner. Um, <coughs> this looks like uh, here we compare, for instance, humidity, temperature at uh, specific times. That you see, and then you have, uh, if you can trigger something, you turn on a ventilator, ventilator offer. So, um, the special part about is these templates are all provided by on your data. If you know a little bit R, or if it's now Python or something, you can really write those things that are here in these tabs on your own, and you can click together if you want so a uh, data application quite easily. So, this is for NetDay, we now have to provide 20 applications like this one. Uh, and we are now really trying asking people what data are you interested in. So often we hear grocery shopping is a very interesting point. So if I spend that much time for Spa, uh, what would it have cost me the last year if I went to Hofer? Um, how much is it different? But the problem is to get this data, this is quite hard. Nevertheless, we are not profit organizations, we are doing this in our free time. Um, 
trying a little bit to make people aware of what data means because I'm quite sure the data is in currency of the future. It will not be euro, it will not be dollar, it will be data. Uh, maybe in 20 years you just go when you go for dinner, uh, you have your data on your mobile and you say, okay, I give you my eating data from the last year and you get a free dinner. If you are a specific group of people, wealthy people, something else, um, I think this deal will be offered by restaurants. And the sooner you start to collect your data, the more data you have and the more wealth you have. Therefore, this is kind of <laughs> our advertisement of our own your data. Um, actually, I would be quite interested what you think about the concept, what you think about the sum of code, um, what is your experience with your personal data. Basically, what you do is when you, um, you call it register plugin, you uh, provide a manifest where it ex uh, explicitly says for each repository, repository is kind of a table, um, who is allowed to, if you have uh, the uh, ID and the secret, who, uh, what you can read and what you can write, update, delete. So who knows the secret can do it. Yes, you can share it and you can have a very fine grained mechanism uh, to define this. The idea is currently we have uh, what we call data folds that is for you. Uh, for the future, we also think about that people can share the data together and put it somewhere online. Maybe anonymized, uh, Apple is doing something uh, quite interesting uh, with told this about this uh, differential privacy. How can you really share data um, without um, <coughs> compromising your privacy. It's a very interesting concept. I haven't found it in the wild quite uh, yet. So implementing this for on your data would be also very interesting. Short answer, yes, you can share it on a very fine-grained level with other people. Uh, browser plugin or something like that? Uh, what we have is, this is a web application uh, to access it. So basically, uh, you have here your data fold, um, where the data is in, and then you write a web application uh, to access it. Where we have uh, plugins is, for instance, um, when you surf the web, you actually generate quite a lot of data. Just to monitor all the websites that you have visited and store it in peer would be a plugin here in uh, Chrome. And so it's just every time that you visit the website, it writes uh, this uh, line into the peer. So this is a plugin we have. Other than that, when you do evaluations, it's usually a web application. No, I mean, that I temporarily give uh, access to my data in my data vault for websites, and, and this is potentially a temporary access. If you look into the future, when I mean, one maybe pass for all your data is that uh, developers say, okay, if you give me that much of your data, you get the application for free. So uh, the application itself writes into uh, the data fold, and you get more data out of the developer gets more data out of the fold than he writes in because he additionally knows where you live, what your income is, uh, some of your habits, whatever. And then you have just the offer to say, okay, do I want to give this data away to get temporarily? So to say, I give now the data from 2015 to 2016, I give it away somehow. I mean, for temporary, for a session. It's just what to, so currently, it's absolutely possible to implement this, but it's not available right now. So this is also, uh, what you see is data fault uh, is on um, GitHub. You have uh, Docker images, uh, it's open source under the MIT license, so everybody is free to experiment with it, extend it. Um, but technically, it's absolutely possible. Okay. If there are no, no other questions. Okay, one last one. Uh, mm -hmm. you're <laughs> it's, it's on the data.eu. Are yes. there other similar initiatives? Do you know of any in other countries? Or? No. Uh, I mean, what I know of, I mean, I'm the mathematics guy in this group. I know of algorithmia.com, 
people who really push uh, how you can make algorithms available to others and include it into your software. Um, I see it more aimed for developers to really have access to machine learning algorithms and so on. Um, for us, it's really the focus to bring the power of algorithms to everybody really to end users, people who just have their smartphone and say, actually, yes, I'm reverse and I generate quite a lot of data. I want to use this data just for my benefit. I don't want to give it away that someone analyzes it in their benefit and then I get some answers. I want just to have a second opinion. When Amazon recommends me a new book, it is not because they think uh, it's so good for me because they make most profit from this book. Now collecting all the data of uh, items that I visited at Amazon, I think it would be interesting to have an alternative algorithm who says, okay, if you're interested in those books, maybe this other book is interesting for you. But since Amazon is not making any money of this other book, I would never uh, know about it. And making this available is uh, yeah, for a uh, society, a digital society as we are right now, I think very important. Mm -hmm. You don't need to upload it, it stays with you, the bank data. Okay. And then the bank app comes to you. You download the Docker image, wherever you want to run it. Okay. Um, but maybe I'm from another bank and I have it in another format. How would this work? Somebody might like to do Absolutely, yeah. Um, you have uh, the possibility first, usually how it works like is you get a CSV file and you have in different columns different information. This is how it usually looks like and this is quite dynamically configurable uh, all in here already. If you want to extend it, you can download it uh, on GitHub, add it and send us uh, a pull request. So this is a developer answer of course. Um, we're thinking about a few concepts that you can even uh, extend it uh, another way, but this is in the very early stages. But of course, it would be nice that you create algorithms and apps that everybody can contribute to and to get bigger and bigger and more powerful. Would be nice, but as I said, you know, next week is our first birthday, still in the beginnings. But if you're interested, uh, come here afterwards, I can show you what is available already right now. Technically, uh, did you look at, at for example, blockchains to, to... Of course, uh, uh, to put your data in a blockchain would be very interesting. So that you can really make sure this data was from two weeks ago, from two years ago, and this is really my data. And maybe then even write algorithms that when you see a result, uh, some chart, that you can find out was my data part of this analysis and in what group was I? And you can, can have the, the sort of money. Absolutely, then you can really trace where it went to. Uh, never ending possibilities. Um, but I always say we need to start to walk before we can run. Right. Um, but uh, absolutely, I'm actually in, uh, in contact uh, with a guy uh, from the Ethereum developers. Um, but still, few things that we need to develop uh, for our data vault now to have it really safe and something post uh, 1.0 is definitely to put uh, the blockchain in. Why is the data safe and uh, what's the value of the data? Basically it's a Postgres uh, database and you have a REST API that you need to authenticate this OAuth to. Oh, okay. so, this is really, really simple technology. So There's nothing fancy. For <coughs> programmers, right? For programmers right now. But then on the front end, you have um, those nice looking apps. You think it's nice looking. Uh, and uh, this is, I'm just a fan of R, but it should be possible with any other uh, language to access it and create apps with it. But here, uh, I think it's not a technical problem to create such a thing, but really making people aware of the value of data. Because currently, we're just giving it away for free. And I think this is a problem. For a society like ours, where data is, uh, the, oil of, uh, data is the oil of the 21st century.
if there, if there are no, no further questions. Thank you again. Thank you.